County Library System welcomes you to our monthly series from the Nevada Historical Society presents High Noon with Neil Cobb. This afternoon's topic is about our journey through time at the Newlands Mansion presented by Melinda and Dan Gustin. My name is Jennifer and I'm happy to be with you here today. And now I would like to introduce Sherry Hayes Zorn with the Nevada Historical Society. Again, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jennifer, and as always, thank you to the Washoe County Library System. Um, without them, we wouldn't be able to provide these great talks to everyone, and this allows us to be able to have speakers throughout the state um, and um, being able to connect them with you on interesting Nevada topics. So um, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I hope you're staying cool as well as you can in this uh, warm July weather and you're enjoying Art Town. Um, I just want to say thank you again uh, for, for joining us today. And I uh, just always want to thank um, our host with the most, Neil Cobb, who has been a longtime supporter here at the Nevada Historic Society. Um, he, he goes out into the community and helps share um, photos and great stories about Nevada history and really helps to get the word out about us. And we really appreciate it. So without further ado, let me introduce Neil Cobb. Hey, Neil. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Thanks a million for the info. Very much appreciate. This is a team effort with the two speakers we have today. So we're going to have individual bios because they're both very productive people. Dan was a graduate from the Santa Clara University with a degree in finance and marketing. In 1965, he was given a choice by his employer to be transferred to either Fresno or Reno. His immediate comment was, what time does the first flight go to Reno? This was by far the second best decision of his life, <laughs> right behind convincing Melinda to marry him. He's been a broadcast business in the broadcast business for more than 50 years, which includes being the voice of the Wolf Pack for 33 years and the Canadian Football League for two seasons. Additionally, he produced and broadcast Nevada high school sports programming for the past 15 years. Past president and director of Truckee Meadows Boys and Girls Club. University of Nevada, Reno Athletic Hall, Hall of Fame inductee, recipient of the Nevada Broadcasters Association Hall of Fame Award. Served on the Reno City Council from 2004 to 2012, and as a liaison to the city's Historic Resources Commission, spearheading the effort for the Pounding Edition and the Conversation District the first such district in the state. There was one other thing that he noticed the first time he showed up at a Historical Resources Commission meeting is there was activity on a very important fountain that we wanted to have moved from the California building and get it somewhere where it could be put back into repair. Well, he jumped a little further into it because he made darn good and sure that he did the research to find out what requirements by the, uh, with RETRAC, being that was a federal program, had a percentage that had to be met with cultural and historical. And so this was very important. He worked very closely with Charles McNeely and was able to bring the dollars in to make this possible. Take a look at it at track level and the Amtrak station right down there in Commercial Road. Melinda's historic preservation interest began as a youngster with her introduction into historic sites throughout US via the family field trips and vacations. Following successful business and human resource careers, and then I got a little side note where I stopped there because I was always fascinated with a, a local place to have coffee and a, and a fantastic bagel or muffin or whatever. 
Uh, they are the people behind the renovated old California market there on California Street and the Shoppers Square and opened up my favorite muffin. Everybody loves that one. So she earned degrees in architecture and landscape architecture and was a con consultant with the landscape architectural firm Sage Green Design, LLC, specializing in historic preservation conservation projects. Melinda was selected as a, a Harrison Fellow at the University of Virginia, where she studied historic landscape designs and documentation at Montesino and the, the Pop, Pop, uh, Polara Forest Plantation. Uh, we're going to have to check that one back out. Uh, plus the historic, uh, historic plant materials from uh, Thomas Jefferson's Tufton Farms. Her historic preservation focus includes landmark sites with an emphasis, emphasis on historic landscape des design, historic plant materials, and treatment recommendations. Her appointment for the Board of Advisors of the National Trust for Historic Preservation initially commenced September of 2006. She served on the City of Reno Historic Resources Commission, the statewide Reserve Nevada organization, and the, has been the president of the State Board of Landscape Architecture, serving since her appointment in 2015 by Governor Brian Sandoval. Additionally, uh, she is a, and, and capitals, and she can explain this, a QWEL, uh, that's the professional, and certified master gardener, which I wish I would have known before. I had many questions. Uh, with the University of Nevada Extension as in a full member of the American Society of Landscape Architects. She and Dan have were recipients of the City of Reno uh, inaugural uh, Historic Preservation Advocacy War Award, as well as the 2007 uh, Historic Preservation Award for the restoration of the grounds and residence of the Newlands Mansion, which has been featured on HGTV's Restore America with Bob Vila and the local PBS House with a History series. She was also very active getting the Herald's Club a plaque and getting it installed there in Virginia Street where it used to be. And in the process, I was able to help with the design of future historic sites so that all of these uh, plaques have the same outside design. You can spot them at that distance. So this was very important. And then just, to bring things to a conclusion here, she has just been the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award from the Historical Resources Commission. I'd like to introduce right now Dan Gustin and his beautiful wife, Melinda. Again, thanks for that introduction, Neil. Um, in, in pulling the, together this presentation, we thought we'd uh, let you know what we'll be covering today. And we're going to discuss the hor historical designation of the Newlands Mansion and its significance, uh, the, our discovery of the property and the property research involved during our purchase, uh, the U.S. Secretary of the Interior Treatment Standards for Historic Properties, We'll show some restoration photos as well as some current condition photos. And of course, we'll talk about some of the lessons we learned along the way. Uh, at the end, we'll certainly be happy to uh, answer any questions some of you may have. And I'd like to turn this over to Dan now. He's going to proceed with uh, our story. Well, thank you very much, Melinda. And the lessons learned along the way are many. So we hope you enjoy as we share some of those with you. The Francis G. Newlands Mansion was designated a National Historic Landmark by the Department of Interior for the U.S. Park Service in 1965. The large 7,000 square foot shingle style house was the home of U.S. Senator Francis G. Newlands from 
1889 until his death in 1917. It's one of only eight Nevada landmarks with this designation and is the only single family residence on the list here in Nevada. Pictured on the left is an undated photograph of Senator Newlands in Washington, D.C., and you see him on the right as a young San Francisco, California attorney. And that's about 1870. Senator Newlands had an active political career. He was elected to the U.S. Congress in, 19, in 1892, and he was there through 1903. He was in the Senate from 1903 until his death, as I mentioned, in 1917. In his service in the House, it included Foreign Affairs and Ways and Means Committees. Some of the assignments included Interstate Commerce Commission, and he was chairman of the Transportation Inquiry Committee and Senate Subcommittee of the 1912 investigation into the Titanic disaster. He additionally served on the 1913 Mediation and Conciliation of Labor Disputes Committee, and in 1914, committee he was on established the Federal Trade Commission. But his monumental legislation, one we're real, really interested in and knowing about him, was the 1903 Federal Water Reclamation Act and the accompanying Federal Water Reclamation Fund, which provided for the irrigation of the arid west and the sale of federal lands, which paid for the various dams and irrigation projects. Well, he was fearful of land speculators, so he personally purchased a, a, a dam and irrigation sites, which included Boca. Stampede and Donner. And then here's the great thing about it. He then around, turned around and sold them for his original cost to the Municipal Water User Associations. It was this federal legislation that was cited in the National Landmark Nomination documents as the criteria for his home being designated as a National Historic Landmark. Well, moving forward with our story, the journey began with a publication, believe it or not, called Home and Lands of Reno Sparks. We picked up a free publication from the rack outside the former Lug Long's drugstore. You might remember that on California Avenue, now a CVS. And we spotted an interesting listing in the Newlands Mansion inside this magazine. At that time, we were totally unfamiliar with the property. So we contacted the brokers listed in the advertisement at Dixon Realty, two really great agents, Sharon Quinn and Liz Brown. And they scheduled a quick viewing for us. They informed us of the property status and provided us with a sales brochure, which was produced by the Natural, National Trust because the National Trust of Historic Preservation was the owner of the property at the time. And it outlined the basic conditions of the sale and possible tax credits. So I've gotten you this far, Melinda will take you from here. All right, thanks, Dan. The property was being marketed originally for its commercial development potential. The National Trust commissioned the firm Architectural Resources Group in San Francisco to prepare a feasibility report. The report provided an analysis of the property's existing conditions and laid out three different alternatives for the site and the building. Uh, use as a single family residence, a bed and breakfast facility, or as a professional office building. Additionally, they also provided a development prospectus that was prepared by Pfluger and Associates Architects, outlining a rather ex intensive office condo project, which consisted of 27 units with multiple buildings and parking lots, which were to be constructed on the site. We received this lovely 1890 original unpublished photo of Francis and Mrs. Edith Newlands from Senator Newlands' great grandson and his wife in the 1990s who came to visit us uh, and take a look at the house. They were very pleased that, it, that we purchased it and that those intensive development plans uh, didn't move forward. This photo is really helpful to us uh, because it helped drive our design decisions that we made for our landscapes master plan. Uh, the Newlands house was quite unique in Reno at the time, uh, given it is the late 1880s. It was originally surrounded by 600 acres, but the grounds of the house are thought to have been designed by a New York landscape architect, Nathan Barrett, who was a founding member of the American Society of Landscape Architects, according to the Newlands biographer, Robert 
at wood. If you look closely at this slide, you'll see that design elements uh, include surface water irrigation with flow gates, a manicured lawn, a dedicated circular carriageway edged with river cobbles, uh, and obviously he also used it for his bicycles, since <laughs> he's pictured there uh, with one. And uh, there you'll also notice a north facing covered porch. Uh, it has wide stairs, which extend the, the full width of the room, and it enjoys expansive views of Peavine Mountain. The home itself was designed to frame the views and has 87 windows. Uh, there's also pictured here a diverse plant inventory, and you can notice some of the specimen nursery trees that were brought in. So we go from that beautifully uh, appointed and landscape uh, property to this, which is what was documented by the National Trust in the fall of 18, excuse me, in the fall of 1984. Yeah, and if it looks like the other side of the moon to you, it did to us originally too. It's just so stark, and you wonder why Alfred Hitchcock maybe didn't think of running some kind of a film there and, and talking about how scary that house could be. Well, with all that being said, well, did that dissuade us? Well, one of the two of us, it did, because I asked Melinda at the time, are you kidding me? She said, I want to buy this house. So we made the purchase. We were married and we moved in right away after a 30-day escrow. That's right, a 30-day escrow. And that's how our journey began. Let's take a tour around the site, beginning at the new entry. The site you saw before, the entry was on the east side. Now this is on the south side and it's called the new entry. The front door was moved from the east orientation. And here it is in 1923 when the library wing was added. These massive columns, as you see sitting there, were constructed at the same time and were in very, very poor condition. With settlement issues, uh, they had, been, had to be replaced because they were on an unstable rubble foundation. And I can tell you a little bit sidebar on that. When we removed those, they were held up by, on top, you see to the left there, the top of that was 16 by 16. And if you have any idea how heavy a 16 by 16 can be, it takes about six grown men to move them. And we did move them from that area. When you approach the house, you see the 1923 library wing. Notice the chimney and bank of French doors on the east elevation. There appears to have been a marked change in the connection of the home to the outdoors after George and Reno Thatcher purchased the home and made several additions. I presume that they enjoyed living inside an awful lot more than being on the outside. Notice on the right, you see a, a step and small concrete apron accommodated the exit from the library doors. That was it. That We'll show you a little bit later what we have done with that, but that's all that accommodates you either going in or coming out. This slide shows the west elevation of the house and the north elevation of the 1923 garage wing addition. Here again, the stairs are narrow. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit ahead of myself. Um, you remember that open air porch that was enclosed? There is no stoop exiting the, the back door, only a somewhat narrow set of stairs terminating into the dessert, dirt. You can see it on the left side and you just, those stairs came down very quickly. The interior of the solarium room, which was open in, the photo that Melinda showed with the bicycles and that side of the room was open. Now it's been closed in this shot that you see. And the, we call it the solarium room. And it's really quite nice with large picture windows on each side. Now we get to the slide that's with the west elevation of the house and the north elevation of the 1923 garage wing addition. That is on the right side of your screen. Here again, the stairs are without we were narrow and without an upper stoop. Also shown as a roof ladder and a TV antenna added to the chimney. I, I don't know, you can see that on the left side and we never found out what the antenna was for. I guess a TV set somewhere in the house, don't really know that. But continuing our walkabout, we see the garage doors, the driveway and a partial view of the front yard. 
To date, we've brought in a total of 54 cubic yards of fractured granite to stabilize the driveway and the parking court. It's a permeable landscape element, which eliminates rainwater runoff and is good material for the period. Here again is the west driveway. It's the view that shows some of the dead trees and stumps. One of the first landscape projects we tackled was the removal of 22 large tree stumps. And I can tell you personally, if I never have another large stump to remove, I'll be the happiest guy on the earth. 22 stumps getting off that property was just enormous. And we only had one exterior hose bib attached to the front of the house. So it's no wonder most of the landscape died due to the lack of water and neglect. Now, this is a picture we really enjoy and really like. This is the 1984 National Trust documentation photo and was taken from across the river. On the north side of the river, it provides a nice perspective of the entire scale of the whole building. You can see it so well from that picture. The National Trust maintains a conservation easement, excuse me, on the exterior of the building and landscape, which requires pre-approval of any exterior modifications. We were provided with this National Park Service publication, which outlines the guidelines for rehab, rehabbing a historic building. And I will just say one thing about the visits. For, I guess, the first 30 years or so, a man by the name of George Suganus would come out every year and visit our property. And he'd walk around the property, taking photos, making notes, uh, seeing what had been done and ask what, what we wanted to do. And we one time we said, George, why don't you come inside and see the house? We'd really like to have you come inside, just relax a little bit because you're walking around this house and in the sunlight and kind of hot on. You said, no, I don't really care what you do inside. It's what you do outside. And finally, we got him in and George was very affable and a great guy. And we enjoyed working with him so much for the Secretary of Interior. But he was hesitant to come inside. I thought that was pretty interesting, but this is the standards for rehabilitation that we use. And this slide explains four the four uh, treatment standards Dan mentioned contained in the publication. Uh, there are four levels. Uh, preservation uh, applies measures to sustain the existing form, integrity, and materials of the building. It focuses on ongoing maintenance. Rehabilitation standard makes possible a compatible use through repair, alterations, and additions, and it preserves the features which convey historical or cultural values. Restoration uh, standard accu accurately depicts form, features, and or character of a property as it appeared in a, during a certain period of time. Uh, it removes existing features from other periods in its history and reconstructs mixing features from the significant period. And finally, reconstruction uh, depicts the form, features, and detailing of a non-surviving site for the purpose of replicating its appearance at a specific period of time and its historic location. Our project's treatment approach may be classified as a rehabilitation since we've adapted our alterations to be compatible with modern living, such as two natural gas boilers we added for heating and hot water use. This slide shows us rehabilitating the stone walls. There have been approximately 350 linear feet along the ridge line that we've rebuilt and maintained. We brought in fractured boulders to rebuild the old walls in place of using the round Truckee River rocks because they are much more stable. And then here's another photo of that process. This slide sh shows the new utility trench beginning at the west end of Court Street and extending along Elm Court to the connection at the house. We now had new electrical, gas, water, and cable service lines. That was a huge project. I might interject, it was a huge project because what we haven't talked about, when we first moved in there, the only room that we could heat in the dead of winter because we moved in the winter time was the master bedroom. I mean, the heating was so poor, that's why we had to make all those changes. So 
those lines coming in made a great difference in our lives. Yes, and we were able to, uh, re as I mentioned earlier, replace the oil, inefficient oil burner with uh, two new state-of-the-art boilers in our basement. Here we installed additional butler's pantry footings and insulation during our kitchen remodel. Four layers of roofing were removed and a new 50-year architectural shingle roof was completed in the early 1990s after a record windstorm damaged much of the old roofing materials. So we considered it pretty lucky uh, that it blew off because it hastened our uh, restoration and replacement of the roof. We take great care when painting the exterior. It's hand brushed without power washing. Uh, the prep work included some shingle replacement and uh, we also were careful only using hand sanding. I might mention in the photo to the right, you noticed the chimneys. We'll come with some information on that very shortly, but those have been up an awfully long time. And that's before we did the rehab, but those chimneys to the right are very important what we did the last couple of years. We commissioned three chimney restoration uh, and rebuilds as Stan just mentioned in the fall of 2022. It was a four month project topped off with custom made spark arresters. We took advantage of the three story scaffolding to repaint the south side of the house once the chimney work was completed. Early on, the National Trust approved removal of the entry columns you saw earlier because they weren't original to the house. Uh, they were added, as Dan had mentioned, in 1923, which was prior to the National Landmark designation. The current entry courtyard plan uh, that we have now was approved by the trust. And this slide shows the concrete pour and the concrete balustrade system we purchased from a private party in Sparks. Dan, Dan can tell you a little bit more about that fun discovery. Yeah, Melinda, leave that slide up a little bit because as you notice on the right, some of the structures, you may have seen those many, many years ago when the MGM was here in town and they had a bus ramp on the side of the building, the ramp came up, dropped people off who were coming either by bus or leaving. And those five upstanding pillars you see right there were part of that. And somebody bought them in Sparks and decided they were going to rebuild their yard. They didn't do it. They put it in the big nickel. My father-in-law said, hey, there's a great project that I think you could do if you could purchase that. So we purchased those. And oddly enough, it fit our courtyard. We had one piece left when we finish the courtyard. So we've been for so many years finding new uses for things and rehabbing and rehabilitating things. That was just one of the projects where we did that. But if you remember the old MGM and the bus ramp, you might have seen those along the side of the bus ramp. Well, here we show the Butler's Pantry Staircase Rehabilitation. Unfortunately, prior to our ownership, the top three stairs and approximately seven feet of the balusters and top handrail were literally hacked out of the room for a wine closet. We still don't understand why they chose to do this rather than using the basement to store their wine. And we didn't know if they don't, wouldn't want to make that walk down there or they didn't like to go out in the, in the outside. But if you see the right where that rail's missing, it is now fully in place. And Melinda's father, my father-in-law spent hours reconstructing that rail. And you now today cannot tell the difference between rail that was there and the rail that added onto it, replaced it all the way up to the top. Anyway, there's an interesting fact about a staircase that defines the description of the house. You may have noticed that the bronze plaque calls this place the Newlands House, and the National Trust refers to it as the Newlands Mansion. Well, Bruce Judd, the Trust San Francisco architect, told us it was a misclassification in the original application for its historical designation stating that it's not the square footage that defines a home as a mansion, but rather, and this is what he said, it's if there is a secondary staircase. 
So that's what defines a mansion. So this staircase is what currently identifies the home as the Newland Mansion. Since the National Trust involvement with the site list it this way in their legal documents. So there might be an awful lot of people out there today, Linda, listening to this, that have two staircases in their house that didn't know they were living in a mansion, and they are. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> kind of fun. Uh, moving on, the electric stove that came with our purchase had one working burner and one oven that occasionally worked. Uh, it, unfortunately, it completely stopped working, wouldn't you know it, on Thanksgiving Day, shortly after we moved in. Consequently, our meal wasn't quite what we anticipated. Uh, but we we made it through, didn't we, Dan? Yes, somehow. <laughs> you can see the walk-in pantry to the left of the stove, and on the right photo, the large we uh, were able to pull out that large pantry cabinet and uh, restored it, and we're using it today in another pantry area. It's the only original piece of furniture that we have. Great care has been taken during our projects to do as little damage as possible and to preserve as much as we can. Minimal lath and plaster disturbance was made during our kitchen rehab. We believe during the 1923 model, a nine foot diagonal brick chimney, which was hidden from view uh, when the wood burning uh, oven was removed. Upon our discovery, it was carefully removed brick by brick, bucket by bucket during our rehabilitation to avoid it crashing down into the kitchen. It was about nine feet long and it was very, would have been very heavy. And it was just a miracle that uh, it didn't accidentally come crashing down. Yeah, I remember walking up that ladder, filling a bucket with bricks and walking back down. It took some time, but again, as you said, we got it out of there. Well, just like the roofing materials that Melinda showed you, the kitchen floor also had four layer, layers of linoleum and plywood. Not sure why the four, but they did. We had the missing wainscoting and baseboards milled to match the original dimensions and beading on the edges of each board. This shows the completed dual fuel kitchen rehabilitation. Removal of the pantry walls transformed the room into a lovely eat-in space designed for a large scale food prepara preparation. That's what it looked like. And you saw it earlier when it was being, when the one stove was in there. Here's a look at the living room and dining room interior design. Our Oriental rug collection began with a phone call from a family looking to sell their mother's three rug collection after she had passed away. And after they had read Gail Delaplane's RGJ story about our purchase of the home. With so many projects ahead of us, uh, it took a little convincing of the both of us to say, do we really want to put that money out for rugs? Well, we decided to do it and made the purchase, and it proved to be the right choice. <laughs> and I like Dan's reasoning. Uh, as he mentioned, with so many other projects ahead of us, uh, he said, well, look at it this way, Melinda. If we buy those beautiful wool rugs, they'll help insulate the floor. Yep. <laughs> so that's what convinced me. Uh, now, and now that we made the necessary structural and mechanical upgrades, it was time for us to focus on rehabilitating the landscape. We designed and implemented a master plan, which incorporates modern stability elements, enhanced circulation patterns, period appropriate plant materials, and most importantly, reconnecting the interior of the mansion to its outdoor setting. Senator Newlands had a love for the outdoors and was an early proponent of the City Beautiful movement, which focused on adding beauty to city landscapes. The photo on the left shows the existing land, uh, library landscape in 1984, which did nothing to uh, invite one outside. There was no place to sit and no pathway leading to anything significant. The trust approved our brick terrace and boxwood landscaping. Uh, and this is a picture of that early planting from 2014. Here's another 2014 photo of the backyard landscape, which the trust approved, um, adding this good sized porch. 
Since 2014, Dan and our handyman have built 87 trust approved wooden solar screens. They filter out about 92% of the sun's UV rays and have lowered the indoor summer temperatures by about 10 to 15 degrees. These combined with the canvas awnings have helped protect the original window frames and indoor furnishings from the sun. After the harsh uh, winter of 2022-2023, we received approval from the trust to upgrade the backyard landscape. We started by removing the broken concrete pavers and the existing sod. As many of you have no doubt experienced at your places, all projects come with surprises. This abandoned drain pipe and concrete footing were a couple of those issues that we faced, but the terrific construction crew was able to work around them. They brought in six inches of gravel base and compacted it in preparation of layering the recycled pavers. This is the completed permeable paver terrace, which improved drainage and provides a large entertainment area. We finished this project just last month, June of 2023. We've taken a long-term sustainable approach when designing the features of our landscape. Rather than purchase new, we, we, we reuse commercial grade concrete pavers rescued from our former office building and on-site broken concrete for this project. It kept them both out of the landfill and made what we think is a beautiful permeable terrace and walkway. Upon completion of the backboard, Backyard Terrace, we rolled right into the East Pollinator Garden Pathway Rehab. The process included the excavation of clay soil, the placement of irrigation sleeves, and again, a six inch gravel base. As you can see, we're nearing completion. Sarah from the Truckee River Rock Nursery graciously provided the extra display guarded broken concrete needed to complete the pathways. Again, this design will allow for the snow and rain runoff to percolate into the ground and remain on site. These, show, these photos show the completed pathways which improved circulation and tied into an existing pergola seating area. Well, that's the extent of our photographs so, but we'd like to share with you some of the lessons that we learned along the way. <laughs> and, and these might help you with some of your projects also. We learned to tackle each project individually, but with an overall view of how it represents period appropriate updates. We didn't want to put, install or design anything uh, that was trendy, but rather kept in uh, organization with the property and uh, the cultural value of the home. And then we paced the renovation and, and on a needed basis, because, you know, you look at all these things and you think, oh boy, that's great, but it takes time and money to do that. And so we couldn't do it all at once. And as we're so happy to talk to you today about this, the project we just finished, a month ago was that backyard and that was quite a project. And you saw some of our photos of the painting projects. Now we've repainted the home quite a few times, mm -hmm. but one of the lessons that was a tremendous learning experience was that one doesn't need to paint the entire house at once. So what we've, uh, what we've done now is uh, take it one section at a time, depending on where. Certainly the west and southern exposures uh, have the most abuse uh, when it comes to um, weathering. And so that's helped us to be able to afford to paint it as we can afford it and address those issues that, that really require immediate attention. The plan we have, and you might wanna be able to do the same thing. So we, play, we paint either a quarter or a third of it on the year that we're gonna paint something. So if you paint a third of it, in three years, you've got the entire house painted and then it'll last for a few years. And just again, a lesson that we learned, didn't think about it till we got into it and saw the cost of doing it. And we passed that on to you. 
Yes. Another thing that, that we try and recall when whenever we're tackling these major projects is to try our best to enjoy the process and keep our uh, vision uh, focused on the end result. Yeah, because when you have scaffolding on your house for four months, that's a long, long time. You don't realize it when you first say you're going to do it that long. But when you start living with it in month three, it becomes a lot of scaffolding up there for a long time. Yes. And and uh, as good as our construction and craftspeople have been, uh, it, it's hard to have uh, people in uh, for extended periods of time. We haven't accomplished this alone. We've had the pleasure of working with skilled craftspeople for ver our various projects and with special individuals like Neil Cobb, a 2023 City of Reno Historic Resources Commission Distinguished Service recipient, whom has helped us share our journey. Yeah, he's standing in front of our fireplace in our library. And Neil, can't thank you enough for everything you've done and the guidance you've given us. Us and everyone else in the city. You've made a tremendous impact on uh, historical properties and projects. By the way, our home uh, will be the final stop tonight on the Harps Mansions on the Bluff walking tour. Uh, the con uh, contact information is listed here if you'd like to make reservations. And then there will be another opportunity to visit the garden on August 26th and 27th of this year during the Northern Nevada Master Gardener Garden Tour, where we'll share specific information about the landscape layout and our plant materials. Uh, the tickets may be purchased on Eventbrite or at Rail City Garden Center in Sparks. The proceeds of this benefit uh, out, uh, will benefit the outstanding University Extension Master Gardener Program. And you can check their website for many of the other gardening classes and events that they offer. Well, we've certainly talked long enough and we appreciate you being with us and listening to our journey through time at the Newlands Mansion. But we also thank the Nevada Historical Society and the Washoe County Library System for allowing us to be part of this High Noon series. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Well, that was wonderful. It was wonderful. Will you guys be able to turn on your um, camera and then we can we can ask some questions and it was a great presentation and and I, I loved how you broke it out explaining um, the different phases and showing photos along the way. So that was wonderful. Um, I know I've got a couple questions and I know we probably will have a few more as well. Um, you had mentioned, um, you know, over time, uh, there was uh, additions and phases. I don't know if I, I caught, how many additions would you say um, were added to the home? Well, structurally, really none to the home. 1923 okay. was the last time. Yes, those 19... Uh... Sherry, those 1923 additions really were the ones that affected the exterior of the home. They okay. included the library and those uh, entry columns, as well as the garage addition. Uh, because remember, when the house was built, there were no there there weren't any automobiles. So uh, they finally got around to adding those. Uh, uh, okay. additions at that time. Since Dan and I have owned the property for going uh, 40 years now, uh, we have been and also the front courtyard area and the removal of those uh, large that large trellis uh, array that was there but the only the only real uh, structural thing that we've done was remove the pantry wall separating the the kitchen from the walk-in pantries and in doing so that allowed us to expand that footprint of the kitchen but everything else has been fully restored and uh, maintained it's the original uh, floor plan of the home. Yeah. Wow. Um, you had mentioned, did you say 86 windows with the house? 87. <laughs> and, and we know that because you, you put 
uh, a screen and a frame around it and it has to go up to the third floor. You don't lose count on that. 87 <laughs> single pane windows, by the way. Yes. And that's interesting in itself because Melinda found some people in town who have inserts or they make inserts for windows. So rather than trying to replace all those and keep the heat in when it needs to be in and out when it needs to be out, we have these inserts and they manage the whole thing along with the, the screens that we have up and it drops the temperature because what we didn't mention, there's no air conditioning in the house. So you can imagine these days, it can get quite warm. So they make a great difference. Yes. A couple of things that the, the trust did approve us when we were talking about modernizing the home uh, from a comfort standpoint uh, is we've uh, added a exterior generator. So in the event of a power outage, uh, that kicks on automatically and it uh, enables us to keep the entire house operational, which is really important to us because of the fact that we have the we've retained the water uh, hydroponic system for our heat and we have wonderful radiators and we love the system so much that uh, we would if we were to ever build a new residence we would look to in adding those as our heating source but uh, if we were traveling and away during the winter if we didn't have that backup generator if the power went out we would for any extended period well, of time, it was, uh, this time in uh, i spent about 10 minutes getting them to get their powerpoint up and carol can you mute yourself <laughs> uh, well i was gonna i was gonna say I, this is my apologies <laughs> no, no, no worries, Carol. <laughs> um, I, I find that fascinating. Um, with the way I, the, I guess the second part of my question, because with all the windows and the inserts, because I've heard of, I know who I think you're talking about with the window inserts, but um, with the design of the house, I know sometimes um, older homes, they would have um, you know, depending if like you maybe would open like the top windows and it would create kind of like an air circulation. Is that part of the design of the home as well? We believe so. The convection power that the house has is really outstanding because it is a full three stories uh, in height. Uh, we uh, the the doors and the bottom windows are opened and we we keep the stairway door to the third floor open with the windows open and it really convects that heat right through the house and with these nice winter or summer breezes that we're having right now it really is helpful and and those inserts by the way have really helped cut down of actually has eliminated the draft that we originally felt when we first bought the home uh, the trust uh, requires that none of the windows be replaced. So that's a heavy maintenance item for us, making sure that the wood is intact and that they're kept in great operating uh, condition. When we first bought the home, most of the cords were broken on the windows, on the double hung windows. And so we weren't even able to open the windows. So that's all been corrected. And it's it's really quite comfortable being located along the river where we get those evening breezes. That's very impressive. And, and the fact that you had to replace or, you know, fix things to keep them going. Cause yeah, I was curious with, um, ha has any of the glass broken that you've had to, um, replace glass? I mean, you know, you've got the wood or were the glass windows okay? Well, they're pretty much intact. We've had just a few panes that had some problems. Uh, unfortunately, when we were having the awnings hung, uh, one of the gentlemen accidentally broke one, but we've been lucky to get some old architectural glass that's been able to replace. So we still have on most of the windows that wavy yeah. aged effect that, that is so valued in historic homes. Oh, that's amazing. Um, so I have a question here. Um, what do you, you use the 1920s library for today? It's a library. <laughs> it's a library. It's a library, um, kind of a sitting room. It leads out onto that little uh, terrace that you saw, that, that, that brick terrace. So it's an entry and exit to that. And we also, we just purchased a very large television set 
which we put in there, 75 inch set. We had ideas of making it kind of a, a, a a studio to watch movies, but we put this television set and it just was in last week. So we use it kind of as a, a get away from the rest of the house to watch television and read. And we we have a full library. Melinda's brother is in the uh, the book business. He sells books throughout the world. So we have a big supply of books. Um, oh, I, we, I can't tell you the number of books we're reading right now. So many different books, but um, I'm trying to remember the one who was the one by the, the one-legged guy who uh, going through life and he was a comedian, but we, we use it as a reading room and kind of entertainment and now maybe even more a television room. Yes, we do have a, a lot of first edition books and I have a couple of hundred uh, books on garden and landscape <laughs> yes, design. So at least. we have more books than we have time, I'm afraid to say. <laughs> but I think that's what a library's for. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that we didn't talk about in our and very briefly we are only the third family to live there so it was newlands and then the thatchers and then when uh, reno thatcher passed away the the trust took it over and then we bought the the house from the trust so we're only the third family to live in a house that was built in the late 1890 1880s that's pretty impressive now you said when you were um reworking the kitchen and you um pulled out one of the um, the pantries that that's probably the only original piece um, of furniture that's still with the place. Um, and now, but the, the rest, like the wood trim, except that um, stairway, I mean, that's all original, correct? Yes. Yes, we have fantastic moldings. Uh, a lot. The home was built out of redwood timbers, and it's in outstanding condition structurally. The some of the floors are not quite as level as you would find in a new build today, but we have shored them up, and uh, so it's really a solid structure. And we have very large, beautiful uh, casement doors, uh, rolling doors that separate the living room from the formal dining room. And they all are operable and in good working condition. All of the uh, the front stair case is intact. All of the other baseboards are intact. And in fact, in our study, uh, we believe we have some original Morris uh, and company, Morris and company uh, wallpaper. And that really is what we wanted to preserve that. And so that is really what set the color scheme for the interior of the home. We drew the colors out of that original wallpaper. I wanted to ask Carol if she, Carol, do you have a question or a comment to make at all? Is she still on, Carol? I, I'm still there. I, I, I finally muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> So when you're looking for plants that are not, not not native, but when they fit the time era, where are you finding them? And are you taking cuttings or what? Well, that's, that's uh, a very good question. When I was uh, back at the University of Virginia, they have Tufton Farms and they reproduce and uh, propagate uh, historic plant materials. So some of our seeds have come from there. Uh, our hollyhocks, as an example, are a very uh, well-beloved biennial plant and so we use those seeds in the garden. A lot of our roses have been sourced through a company in Oregon that specializes in rose materials that are on their own rootstock so they are not grafted. Okay. And the, import, the importance of that is so that when you buy a particular rose that is a certain color uh, it won't change back to the original rootstock color okay. in the preceding years. So a lot of roses have been patented for different dates. And so we focus on some of those roses in, in the garden. Mm. I want to mention something. We talked about hollyhocks. And if, if there's somebody out there listening and can make it tonight to the, uh, the tour, the, uh, what is it, the Mansions on the Bluff tour, what Melinda does when those tours come by, she has a packet of hollyhocks 
that she gives to everybody so you can plant in your garden. But that's one of her pride and joys, those hollyhocks. And she loves to spread those around and give them to people. So anybody that comes tonight gets a free packet of hollyhock seeds. Yes, and they were growing at the Newlands Mansion. They were growing there. And harvested. Yep. <laughs> so kind of like jelly apple seed. Yeah. We're spreading the <laughs> Without the apples. Yeah. Yes. One of the other things that we've included, too, when we went back to the National uh, Trust Office in Washington, D, uh, excuse me, in uh, San Francisco, before they closed that office and moved to Washington, D.C., Dan and I spent three days there documenting and going and photocopying all of their records and old photographs. And we found that uh, at one time there were fruit trees and grapevines on the property. So we've on the west side in a uh, reestablished an orchard, and we have big cherries and nectarines and pears and apricots. Yep. And uh, we, Dan and my dad, also uh, revived some old uh, Pinot Noir grapevines, which were just tumbling uh, down the ridge line. And so they uh, raise them up. And so when we have a good vintage year, uh, we like to make cordial. <laughs> yeah, we make a Pinot Noir cordial. It's, we found out how to do that, but I won't go into detail right now. But yep, that's one of the things we do. Well, don't want to take too much time, but if you have any questions, we'd be more than happy to sit here and answer them for you. Well, we have a uh, see there. We have a couple people saying great work on the restoration, and thank you for the very interesting presentation. It was obvious this has been a labor of love for you. Uh, while the landscaping is wonderful, I'm most interested in seeing inside the house. And you were just asking whether or not there's upcoming tours of the interior or just the exterior, and um, and any opportunities beyond these two upcoming ones to tour your beautiful home. Well, we'll probably have it opened uh, for the interior viewing sometime. We've done that on occasion, but we've really been, our major projects have been focusing on the landscape. So that's what, what we've been uh, showcasing most recently. It's very impressive, I, I must say. And and the and then seeing your just your plan with your master plan, I was I was very impressed. Um, I do have, I see another question. Did we see a chimney on the garage edition in one photo? There, they, I'm sorry, there might have been a little confusion with that. Yeah. Uh, there was no chimney on the garage. That one nine foot chimney that was hidden in the crawl space uh, was connected to what we believe was a wood burning uh, cook stove in the kitchen. So the reason it was concealed was because at one time the chimney that would have extended through the garage roof wasn't there when we purchased it. Uh, and the uh, architects that did those feasibility studies also had no idea that it was concealed uh, there. But but we do have three chimneys. One is in the library. One is in the main section entry of the home. And then the third one on the back side that was pictured with the scaffolding is the three-story chimney uh, in the living room. In the one interior shot, you might have seen it. It was white in the background on the right side of that shot. That's the one that she's talking about. Yes. Wow. Um, let's see. I have another one here. Um, you refer to the trust allowing things. Will you please explain what that means? Um, does that mean the trust decides what is done or allowed, I guess, maybe as part of your question? Well, that's a very good question. Yes, Thanks for asking that because it's a it's a pretty interesting component uh, connected to this property. As Dan had mentioned, the National Trust uh, maintains what's called a conservation easement, but it just covers the uh, exterior of the, the house and of the grounds. So at the time in 1984, when we purchased it, it was quite extensive. And that really was before there were a lot of uh, neighborhood homeowners associations. So we really uh, made the commitment to the home, made the commitment to the restoration of the grounds and the house. So we knew and felt comfortable with signing that uh, conservation easement that we'd be able to comply with it. And it requires any uh, tree or any shrub that has a trunk that's larger than a three inch diameter 
uh, for removal, we would have to have approval on. But we felt comfortable with that. Uh, we didn't want to modernize the exterior of the home. So we felt comfortable with agreeing to abide by that conservation uh, easement. It The people from the National Trust have been wonderful. We have had nothing but a positive experience with them and we'll submit a plan or a uh, suggestion with some ideas and supporting documentation of why we would want to do what we have planned. And they immediately, it's usually a 24 hour turnaround time with them and they've approved every single thing that we've wanted to do. Uh, the most recent ones were the installation of the generator, which has to sit outside the home. Uh, and of course, that wouldn't have been there in the 1890s or 1880, late 1880s. So they approved that because they realized that it was an important update that would protect the house. And what I would add to that question is what it really means is that you are consistent with the time period in which the house was built. So any changes you want to make outside need to be consistent or at least very, very close to confirming, conforming, excuse me, with what was would be there or what would have been there when the house was built. That's what it really means. So there's another question here. Any history of ghosts in the house? <laughs> great. We, oh, that's a great question. No, there aren't, but we have had, um, friends of ours who have youngsters and they come over and it's a little foreboding when you look up all those stairs and you see those rooms <laughs> and eh, we didn't dissuade them by saying there might be ghosts up on that third floor and had some fun with them for a few years. So, you know, that's like Santa finding out when you're old enough, you find out there's, yeah, there's a Santa, but they're usually related to you. So they realize that there really aren't any ghosts there. But for a while, we had some some youngsters in six, seven, eight years old that thought that eh, there may be some ghosts here, but no, they're not. No, but that's an interesting question because we uh, did a restoration on our office building, the uh, Hawkins House, which is right at the end of Court Street. And we had on occasion, uh, several of our employees working late at night would hear a lot of creaks and uh, noises in the home. And let me tell you one story about that. Um, we had the alarm system and we were alarmed that something was going on in the house. So I went down there, didn't see anything, called the police. The police came and they said, okay, I said, I'll go inside. But no, they didn't want me to go inside. They said, you wait out front. And the officer that came by had a dog. He op I opened the front door for him, pushed it open, and he started in. The dog would not go in. It, that whole night when he was there, he went throughout the house and looked at it. But for some reason, that dog was a little hinky about going inside. So whether it was a ghost in the Hawkins house, I don't know that, but I know a canine that's bred to do that and find out if things that we don't see are in some place, he wouldn't go in. That's interesting because you're absolutely right. They do sense different things. So that that is an interesting story. <laughs> we didn't we didn't need a need for have a need for Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't. But there, <laughs> So many stories we have, but we don't want to take everybody's time. But we thank you so much for the opportunity to explain what we went through and what this house is. And, you know, we look at ourselves as caretakers. As I said earlier, we're three families. We're the third family. There'll be a fourth family. And we hope that they still have the dedication that we've had over the period of time to keep this as a national landmark. That's that's what it's all about for us. Absolutely. And you can definitely you can definitely tell you're so passionate about it. And and then Carol mentioned this is magnificent. I'm so heartened by your concern for historic maintenance, but with an eye to the future of recycling and energy efficiency. And I was impressed by that, too. Um, yeah, this was just a wonderful uh, presentation. and We so appreciate it today. So um, let me um, it, Neil, do you have any questions or Carol, any other questions? Just to thank them from the bottom of my dark little heart. <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> a wonderful program. Thank you so much. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Carol and Cheryl. Well, 
Yeah, absolutely. Well, then I want to thank everybody so much. Uh, sorry for uh, the initial little glitch, but wonderful presentation. And thank you again, you know, uh, for the wonderful presentation and the great pictures. It was really helpful and insightful, too, with the project that you have been working on for many years. So without further ado, let me um, send it back to Jennifer. And thanks again, Washoe County Libraries, for helping us with our High Noon series every month. Thank you. That's a terrific house. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Sherry Hayes Zorn, Neil Cobb, Belinda and Dan Gustin, the Nevada Historical Society, and Tim, our Washoe County Library System Tech Wizard, for making this event possible today. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Yeah.